coming okay. through. So I called this blog in about bubbles, how to get published a 13 step real time workshop. And uh, I've been an advertising writer for over 45 years. And, and my advertising logo was on the left. And uh, I found this woodcut in the 19, mid 1970s when I started writing. And then over the years I had the uh, Apple laptop and the Bluetooth earphone added. And then for, for scuba diving, and scuba writing and travel writing, I had a friend of mine add the mask, the snorkel, and the tank. So it's kind of a renaissance man, but that that's kind of me all over. So And I want to point out that Gil did the end cups uh, envelopes that I'm still using. Good. And Helga, do you have any of the newsletters that I wrote? I know I wrote them for like 10 years because you saved um, everything. Yeah, I do, but they're probably in my garage somewhere. Okay, don't worry about it. Do you want I them? Wanted, I just wanted to know how many I, I wrote, but it's not important. Oh, okay. no, I'd have to go dig out it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry All about right. it. Your garage is <laughs> probably That's very crowded. Yeah, I know. Okay. All right. So uh, a friend of mine wrote a book called How to Talk Funny, and he had me edit it. And while I was editing it, I read the book, and, and he said, you should always start a presentation with a joke. So here's a joke that I think is relevant to this. This uh, young woman graduates from high school, is kind of a lost soul, doesn't know what, what she wants to do. So she said, I think I'll become a nun. So she goes to this convent and she sits down with the mother superior and mother superior says, sister Helga, uh, I have good news and bad news for you. The, the, the good news is we want you to be one of our nuns, but the bad news is we have a vow of silence and you only get to say two words every five years. So the first five years goes by and she sits down with Sister Helga. She says, what do you have to say for yourself? I'm going to write this in your permanent record. And she said, bed hard. She goes, okay, bed hard. I, I got that. See you in five years. So another five years goes by. She says, what do you have to say for yourself now? And she said, food, bad. She goes, okay, the food is bad. We all know it's crappy food. So another five years goes by and she said, what do you have to say for yourself now? And she says, uh, shower, cold. And she said, you know, Sister Helga, you've been here 15 years and all you've done is bitch, bitch, bitch. So uh, what's my point? My point is along the way on my dives, on my trips, I've learned how to bitch, not to the people on the dive boats or the dive masters, but when I write an article, I I, I tell the truth. You know, if the, if the dive master is selfish and goes down and looks at us and takes off on his own for an hour, or if the captain is an alcoholic, or if the food is particularly bad, or there's bed bugs at the resort. Uh, I bitch about it in my reviews, in my stories, to let other people know what to expect. So um, I'm just sharing that note that everyone should be a little bitchy when they come to taking notes and writing about their experiences. So in the audience here, when I talk about blogging about bubbles, I know everyone here is a diver. I know everyone's a photographer. Uh, how many of you are videographers? How many of you are bloggers? Or are you social media enthusiasts? Or are you just curious about writing? Uh, so a bit about me. My my brother is on, on the Zoom tonight. We're twins. This is him. His name is David. That's me. He's 32 minutes older, which is kind of a long time for twins. I know twins a minute apart. I know twins 20 minutes apart, but they were born on the cusp on two different days. And I know twins uh, an hour and a half apart. And that's our dad. And we, we were born and raised in San Francisco. Uh, I'm married, my wife is Ellen. Our daughter is Sarah, she, she's an attorney. She lives in the DC area and works there. And she's gonna, have a big birthday this year. We all have big birthdays this year, but we're very proud of Sarah. She went to uh, University of Rochester and Hastings Law School. So, as I said, I've been, I was a member of NCUPS for at least 10 years. Then I moved to Marin. I've been a member of Marin Scuba Club for about 10 years. I write our website. I maintain our website. I write our monthly newsletter. Very active in the club. And in, like your club, we have good people. And... Um, even some of the members of your club are in my club, like Sue in Virginia. So where I have dived, and I am mostly a warm water wuss. I've dived in Australia, the Barrier Reef, Aruba, three islands of the Bahamas, Belize, uh, 
San Francisco, I've dived in, in the old roundabout tank at, at uh, Steinhardt Aquarium, Monterey, a trip with N Cups, and Channel Islands, a couple of trips. Grand Cayman, a little Cayman, places in Florida, including in Orlando at Disney World's Living Seas exhibit. Bunch of diving in Hawaii, both sides of Mexico, Kazrai and Micronesia. I was certified in Granbury, Texas, in a reservoir about an hour south of Dallas with horrible visibility and in uh, Provo in the Turks and Caicos. So that's my diving history, virtually all warm water. And that's what I still prefer. So my writing credentials, if you're going to be a writer and write about uh, scuba, it's very uh, important to have uh, a love of writing. And for me personally, it was a very natural transition from writing about advertising to writing about scuba because I learned how to write strong headlines, strong leads, which is the first paragraph of copy to draw readers into a story and uh, and copy that that is either humorous or enticing that, that gets the reader to move along. And I've been fortunate to, to be nominated for five Clio Awards, which are like the Oscars of advertising and at least 20 other awards. And conservatively, I've written well over 8,000 projects uh, over my career. Then I'm just retiring now from advertising writing but I'll continue doing travel writing and uh, scuba writing. I'm very active in that now. I wrote about 30 articles and newsletters just last year. Okay, so uh, my writing career has two parts. The first part, I worked in ad agencies for 17 years in San Francisco and in Dallas. And they include some of the biggest agencies in the world like BBDO and Gray and Ketchum and smaller agencies in Dallas, like Bozell and Jacobs and Bloom. And uh, between 1989 and 1995, I got laid off three times, which led me to eventually freelancing, uh, being a freelancer full-time. So part two is over the last 30 years, I've been a prolific freelancer, working for ad agencies, working for clients directly, all kinds of clients from Bank of America to Visa, to Charles Schwab, to Levi Strauss, into it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. PricewaterhouseCoopers, the list goes on. But I've written more than 2,000 radio and TV scripts, hundreds of newsletters, more than 250 websites, over 2,600 blogs, and social media posts, and so on. So a lot of a lot of copy over the years. Uh, <laughs> the first two radio commercials I ever wrote uh, back in 1975 and 1976 were nominated for Clio's and other awards later that year. And I'd like to say my career has been pretty much downhill ever since. <laughs> Not really, but that's what I say. So in 1981, I met this woman, Janet, who lived in Dallas through friends. And we went to the Cayman Islands together. And uh, it was a resort course. And she was a diver. I was learning how to dive. But you can see how warm the water was. 82, I was diving in an old horse collar. BC and a t-shirt, a weight belt and, and trunks, no, no dive skin, no wetsuit. And the Viz was the best I've ever seen, 150 to 200. It was just like glass. And uh, then I moved to Dallas in 82, the following year. Uh, on my birthday, the fourth day I was there, she dumped me. Uh, but I made the best of it. I created the nickname Gil Bob. I've got license plates to say this. Gil Bob, I bought two condos because it was so affordable there. And so four years later, I moved back to San Francisco. And uh, I like to, whenever you meet people at a cocktail party, they say, what do you do? And I say, I'm an advertising writer. And they always say, have you written anything that I've seen or that I know? And so some of the things I've done that are major accomplishments is I wrote campaigns for Bank of America, this one was for refinancing home loans. Anyone looking for refinancing can find this out of little interest. It was a major victory to get something humorous passed through, passed and approved by Bank of America. And something else I've written was for Del Monte. This was a, uh, a coupon insert in the Sunday paper, top off your barbecue with the pickles people relish most. I like that one. And um, I introduced Quicken 
uh, introduced QuickBooks to Quicken users with this direct mail piece in 1995 that built that brand for Batter Blaster, if anyone's ever heard of that, is this was a can of organic pancake and waffle batter. I wrote a TV commercial that helped them get sold into Costco that launched the brand. Everyone has had credit cards since the 1950s, but debit cards started in the 1990s. And I wrote the program, uh, the binder actually for Visa that they sold into member banks to make the debit card happen. And I introduced dockers, um, wrinkle-free dockers to the retail trade. And for Palm One, which had the Trio 650 smartphone, one of the first smartphones, I wrote this catalog and they printed a million copies of this catalog and it sold in the first smartphone. So those are some of my major accomplishments as well as writing the packaging for what, what was Granny Goose potato chips and now they're the Hawaiian potato chips. Now they've been bought by another brand but even today, about 15 years after I wrote the package copy, the romance copy on the back of it, they still use the same copy on their uh, packaging. I wish I got royalties for it. So now into travel writing and scuba writing. Uh, in 1995, I was working for an ad agency. Sitmar Cruises was their client. They got bought by Princess a few years later. And so for them, I started writing travel about travel by writing shore tour brochures, which were excursions you can take when you go to Mexico or the Caribbean or Alaska on the ship. So that was my first travel writing experience. And then a turning point in my career was after I got laid off from gray advertising in 1989, I, uh, I started keeping a diary because I, I had moved back to San Francisco. I bought a condo in Sausalito. I had two in Dallas and I lost my job. So I had no job, three mortgages, and I was very angry at being laid off. So I started keeping a diary and I sent, I had a friend in Dallas who worked for Adweek magazine. He said, uh, send your diary to this person in LA, this person in New York. And they, they called me and they said, we'll pay you a thousand dollars for your diary. And we'll publish it nationally in two consecutive weeks of Adweek magazine, which was a regional magazine. So this was a, a breakthrough for me and a turning point because all the ads I ever wrote had a short headline and maybe a hundred words at the most, where this this was an article with hundreds and you know maybe a thousand words over over uh, eight weeks of or twelve weeks of, of the article. So as I said, it was a turning point because it was the first time I wrote a long article that is like a, a magazine article. And it's the first time I wrote uh, in that in that format. And that gave me the confidence to be able to write for magazines. So my scuba writer credentials, as I've been writing about travel and scuba for 30 years, I've written over 200 articles and newsletters and websites that have been published. And about a third of them have contacted me through SEO keywords on my website. And I'll give examples of those later. But a, a client I still have now, that's a, an ad agency in Ohio that does what they call travel marketing uh, contacted me 12, 13 years ago through my website. And I still, I've got two projects coming up with them now to write visitor guides, one for a city in Oregon and one for a city in uh, in Arizona. So they're, they're a great client and it's fun to write these projects. So uh, as I told you, I got certified in 1985. This is me with all my gear. The water temp was 60. The visibility was two to 10 feet max. I mean, it was a silty bottom and <laughs> some of the worst diving conditions I've ever been in, far worse than Monterey. But if you could dive there, you could dive anywhere. So uh, in, in 2010, I launched the Travel Copywriter page of my website when I first used this artwork. And uh, it helped me turn what I called a side hustle into a revenue stream. And this page continues to get people contacting me about writing travel projects because I have SEO keywords in here. The headline is travel copywriter. I have the word travel copywriter sprinkled throughout the copy every two, 300 words. Uh, and that's the secret to being found in SEO. And then this is a sample of one of the visitor guides I wrote for them. This was for Muskegon County. I think it's in Michigan, but this was about a, 
a, a big timber mill. And uh, so, as I said, since 2011, I've been writing for this ad agency in Ohio. I've written over 25 visitor guides for 20 cities in 10 states. Some cities like Irvine, California, I wrote three or four of those over the years. So the article or the, the main topic tonight, here are the guidelines that I'm going to go over. For blogging. Um, Gil, did you go uh, to these cities in order to write this copy? Uh, actually, I've not been to any of them, Helga, except Irvine. Uh, but this year, now that I'm retiring from advertising, I am going to ask them to send me up to Oregon or down to Tucson or other cities so I get a better picture of what I'm writing about because all the other <laughs> things I just wrote blind. Okay, you did an excellent job. Thank you. Thank you. So the, the guidelines for blogging about bubbles are three things. And this for all writing, whether it's travel writing or anything. Create enticing headlines and captions for your beautiful images and for the articles. Write well-crafted copy with a strong lead. And I'll give examples of these for many of the things I've published. And something I've always done is keep detailed log books to tell intriguing stories because I wrote I wrote a story about diving in Monterey uh, with end cups um, just, just last year that I, I had never uh, written it before. I'd been wanting to write it. And because I looked through my log books and saw the water was 50 degrees and how cold I remembered how cold I was, uh, now I was near hypothermic, that helped me write the story. So those are the three uh, guidelines. And so this is the first of the 13 steps. And uh, step number one is you have to be thick skinned. Anytime you're dealing, I mean, as photographers, you submit your photos to websites, you submit your photos to competitions, you submit your photos to uh, magazines for publication, you're rejected far more than you're accepted. Uh, so uh, you're going to have to stomach a lot of rejection. So my advice is bounce back from the rejections and celebrate the wins. And this, this Snoopy cartoon was, was good. Dear contributor, contributor, we are returning your stupid story. You are a terrible writer. Why do you bother us? We wouldn't buy one of your stories if you paid us. Leave us alone, drop dead, get lost. And Snoopy said, probably a form rejection, rejection slip. So, so I said, you're going to have a lot of rejection. I mean, fortunately, I've had extremely little uh, rejection because I've been lucky and I know um, a thing or two about writing. So that's step one, be thick skinned. Remember that. Step two, be bold. So the first article I published was in 1994. I had been in Australia the year before uh, with my wife, who's not a diver. And I, I just sent them an article and they published it. I, I didn't. I, I think I, this is when email was first starting. So I know I sent them a hard copy of the article and I, I know I also emailed them, but uh, the article was called, called, So You Can't Make the Reef. And the lead, the first paragraph said, I became the poster child for Murphy's Law at Australia's Great Barrier Reef. I assumed the world's largest living thing would be easy to visit. I assumed wrong. Four of my five planned dive days were canceled. So as I said, by the way, this article was all about bitching. It was about the things that went wrong in the first half. And the second half was things you could do when you can't go diving, like take a cruise from Cairns or Port Douglas, take a four-wheel drive safari through the rainforest, et cetera. But all these articles are on my website. You can read them later. I'll give you the link. So step number two is be bold. So take a risk. Send your articles, send your photos to magazines and hope for the best. Uh, another thing with, about being bold was uh, this has nothing to do with travel yet in this presentation, but it has everything to do with me. Uh, my brother and I, my sister, met Walt Disney when we were seven years old in Disneyland. And I wrote this about it, and it's on my website. And this is a picture my dad took of us. But I'll, I'll get back to that later and how that tied into a story I wrote. And uh, step number three is be promotional. I wrote this ad in 1985 for a new business pitch for Porsche. And the headline said, Porsche separates Le Mans from Le Bois. And this, this was not an, this was an ad concept. It was part of a presentation. It never was published. It was never shown anywhere but my website. But in the year 2000, it was ranked as the number two best Porsche ad ever. And since it's then- It's really great. 
three people, three people now have bought prints of this. Uh, about 10 years ago, a man called me from LA and he said, I collect Porsches and I collect Porsche posters and I want to buy your original artwork. And I live in LA and if we agree on a price, I'll fly up there tomorrow in my own plane and buy it from you. So I sold the original artwork for $1,500. And since then I've sold prints of it for $100 each and, and just two in the last year. Um, but so by being promotional on my website, people have found this and offered me money to buy it. Uh, and another way to be promotional, I'm a member of the International Travel Writers Alliance and I joined them about five years ago. So as a member, I know I could write to them and get published. So I sent them my pictures that I sent you that you used to promote me tonight and a little bio about me. And this went out to 10,000 publicists. And I thought, oh, someone's going to offer me a free trip. Well, they didn't do that, but at least it was there. Um, so step four is be aware of what editors like. A friend of mine, a friend of a friend of mine was a, uh, was the editor at Dive Travel Magazine out of Santa Cruz about 30 years ago. And this guy was very funny. He wrote the book, Diving for Dummies, Scuba Diving for Dummies. And I knew he liked humor. So I wrote this story. I, I took a picture of my daughter and he embellished it with these angelfish. And I, I called the article, My Dive Buddy Wears Diapers, Baby Makes a Splash. And the lead said, my dive buddy prefers warm water. So do I. Every evening we gather our gear, approach the dive site and take the plunge. And so these are my recollections of, giving, of, of sit, sitting next to the bathtub, giving her a bath, she's splashing me. And um, it just reminded me of, of going diving because it was warm water. Uh, but because I knew what the editor liked, I was able to get this published. And then because I had a pipeline to him and he had published me, uh, and I've done this over the years with many magazines, I kept sending him articles. So another story I got was called Waterlog Proposal, where I, it says, taking the plunge into marriage. And, uh, and the lead says, I tried to propose to my wife underwater. She almost drowned. This was in Provo, in the Turks and Caicos. And my my dream and my goal, and she wanted to take a, a resort course. She was going to take a resort course. I was going to propose that afternoon on a slate, but she got freaked out in the pool. And um, so I ended up proposing to her on the beach, but it made for a good story. So another, uh, and then they contact, they started contacting me and they said, excuse me, they said, we're doing a story on, uh, on, on Cabo and La Paz. Have you ever been there? I said, yeah, I was there on a liveaboard. So I wrote this three page article. They paired me up with uh, two other writers and I wrote on the road in the dive briefing about Baja, that was three pages. And they published me with, with two other people. And then they were doing an article called family planning where it was about diving and going on vacations with your family. So I wrote two pages for that as well. And then they went out of business but it had nothing to do with my copy, I don't think. So step number five is write about what you know. An editor from Adventure Journal contacted me a few years after that. And she said, um, let's have lunch and let's talk about your diving experiences and, and, and uh, what might happen. So I wrote a story that they titled Whale Symphonies and, and uh, it, they gave it a very, I, I called it, I had a very short title, but they called it Scuba Divers Dance on Back Song, Keeping Time to Warm Waves That Crash Out Off Maui's Southern Shores. And this was in 1998. But the lead, one of my favorites, I said, well, on my honeymoon, I fell in love with another man. So did my wife, and we're not even swingers. He was a big fellow, 45 feet long, 30 tons with a beautiful voice. And this told a story about a snorkeling near humpbacks. And as you know, sound travels very well underwater. And the songs that we heard reverberated through our body. And that was a pretty amazing experience. Uh, so another, uh, okay, yeah. So another part of step five, right about what you know, is I took that same story and I repackaged it with a blog I had written from last March about going to Maui and seeing all the humpback whales. This is a few months before the big fire in Lahaina. So just, Three weeks ago, I published this at Dive Pacific, where I now have a pipeline with the new editor. 
I called it Maui, a whale of a sun-splashed winter wonderland. And, you know, we all love a wonderful photo. This was far better than any photo I ever took. So this is a stock shot that I bought from 123RF because it was a better shot than I had. And this said over 12,000 humpbacks arrive annually between November and May. So this article combined that with, uh, and, and the fact of all the whales we saw from the beach, from our, our hotel room, from, uh, from, from uh, snorkeling boats out to Molokini, and uh, as well as, as what happened on my honeymoon, that combined two things. Another thing about right what you know is NCUP's newsletter. Remember this, anyone? So in 1996, uh, I wrote this, and I had just come back from Disney World with my wife and daughter, where I, I scuba dive in the Living Seas exhibit tank. And as a longtime Disney fan, you see my Mickey Mouse watch. I've had this since, since high school. Um, as a longtime Disney fan, I saw in Disney Magazine that anyone can go diving in their scuba tank, just like I know riders can scuba dive in Monterey. Uh, so I contacted them. They go, yeah, it costs 50 bucks or whatever. And, and uh, so I made arrangements in advance. And I called the article M-I-C-K-U-I-S-C-U-B-A. In this 6 million gallon aquarium, the fish are real, the coral is pure Disney. And then this goes back to the photo I had. I met Walt Disney in 1956 in Anaheim. 40 years later, I never imagined that I'd dive in his aquarium in Orlando, Florida. So I wrote this and I probably wrote a hundred newsletters for you, but as I said, I don't remember how many. So I didn't list it in my, in my accomplishments that you'll see later. Uh, and then step six, we're about halfway through now, is be persistent. I, uh, I was very lucky with Alert Diver. The first four or five stories I sent to them were all published. So the first one, but I was, I had wanted to, to uh, publish with them for a long time. So I was persistent in thinking about angles that would appeal to their audience that were medically oriented. So the first one was called The Sun Also Burns. Besides rising each day, the sun brings us warmth, light, and burning rays. So the lead says, barbecued ribs, braised shoulders, baked legs. These sound like summer grilling choices, but they're really describing the effects of hot, the hot sun on your skin if you don't take precautions with sunscreens and protective clothing. Skin cancer is something that all divers should think about. And because I'm fair skinned, I've had my share of, of uh, skin cancer. So I was very... Uh, it's very important for me to write an article about sunburn to, to let other people know that 15, 20 minutes in the sun, you can get a severe burn in tropical weather, especially. So another story for Alert Diver happened in uh, the Great Blue Hole in Belize. Uh, they, on the cover, they called it NART, but I called it low anxiety. You know, Hitchcock had high anxiety. This was low anxiety because I was 130 feet down. What's round, midnight blue, a thousand feet wide and over 400 feet deep. The Great Blue Hole of Belize, one of the world's foremost dive destinations. It's a spectacular underwater cavern where I got narked, ran out of air and broke my watch 130 feet below the warm Caribbean surface. Uh, another story for them was called To Dive or Not to Dive. This, this happened in Florida. I, I was a... Uh, on a boat out of West Palm Beach, and I went down uh, with a group, and uh, the dive master was supposed to be my my dive buddy. But as soon as I jumped off, my dive mask fogged up. I had to go up and clear it. By the time I started going down, I couldn't see anybody um, because it was it was very choppy. There was a lot of current, and and I couldn't see anyone. I was I was hovering there about. 15 feet below the surface, and I just thought through my mind, I can't find them. They're not looking for me. It, there's a strong current. I'm going to abort the dive. It's the safest thing to do. And, and that's what I did. And when they came up, I went up to the dive master. I said, hey, I aborted the dive. He said, oh, I thought you were next to me the whole time. So it's even better that I aborted it because he didn't even miss me. Hey, another story for uh, Alert Diver was Equipment Upgrade 2.0. Your gear may be years old, it still works, but is it safe? So it's important that I just bought a new regulator after having my first one since 1985. Okay, another one is be persistent. 
Uh, California Diving News, I met them last year at, um, well, I've been reading it for years, but they, they were the host of Scuba Show uh, in Long Beach. I know Bruce was a presenter there, I was too. So I, I met them and I met the publishers, the father and daughter team, and I started sending them stories. And um, one story I wrote about Monterey, they, they said, no, that we don't want people to get the wrong impression. We know it's cold in Monterey, but we don't want to scare off anyone who wanna, might, be, wanna, might be a diver or want to come to our scuba show. So I, I sent them a few stories and then I finally sent them one in November about what something at, at my dive club uh, one of our, our dive buddies, Ken, came up with Blue Friday, which we called the healthy alternative to Black Friday, shopping insanity, shop, don't dive, don't shop, dive. And we said, do you wait all year for Black Friday? It seems only natural, if not compulsory, to drive to a mall and buy stuff. When he's promoting people to go diving on Blue Friday, and he called it Black Friday. So I got it published in California Diving News. I got it published in Undercurrent to 40,000 readers. I got a story in the Marin IJ. Uh, Ken and I were interviewed by Scuba Radio, who we met at the, at the convention. Uh, I got a blurb in the uh, International Travel Writers uh, Alliance, a story in Dive Pacific, a story in Sun Divers Rotan, who I'm going to dive with next month, and a story in Local Getaways. So one story that got repackaged and repurposed in seven or eight different uh, magazines and websites. And I thought that was a pretty good accomplishment. So another step is be, be opportunistic. In 2002, I uh, was about to go to Aruba and for years I'd seen their ads in Skin Diver Magazine. So I called them up at their 800 number and I made a reservation for two, two tank dives, two days. And then I looked them up on the website and I found out their corporate offices in San Francisco in the same building where I once worked. So I called them up and started talking to someone who turned out to be the marketing director. I introduced myself and I said, I noticed your uh, newsletter is out of date. Uh, I can help you with that. And she said the magic words, do you want to work a trade? I said, hell yeah. And so uh, she said, if you write me a long article, this was before they were called blogs. And she goes, if you write me a long article, I will comp you for your two days of diving a submarine ride for you and your daughter. Um, what else did we do? We did a, a booze cruise, a sunset cruise. We did a snorkeling uh, lunch cruise. And um, and I did a parasail ride. So I called the article uh, Water Sports Paradise Found. And I said, I traveled over 4,000 miles to find a water sports paradise. It's called Aruba. It really was a delightful island. It's great for my daughter who was like, eight at the time. Um, and so this was barter at first and then bucks because then I had an arrangement or I had a relationship with with the client where she trusted me, I trusted her. So I wrote their four websites, one for the corporate website, one each for a room, for a Grand Cayman, Hawaii and St. Kitts. And then I wrote 24 quarterly newsletters for seven years so they were, they were one of my best clients ever. And, uh, and then around the year 2005, I was contacted by a company out of Canada called Vagablond, which was a blog. And they were the, one of the first travel blogs, but they were not just travel, but they were travel, food, wine, and shopping. So during that time, I wrote about 1,500 articles and they were paying me for each one. So it was a very profitable arrangement. And about 30 of them were about scuba. Uh, and I'll show you some of them in a minute. So some of the favorite headlines I wrote for Vagablon, and I categorized them for a pun, uh, hiking half dome, uh, a long day's journey into height, alliteration, cool, classy Kimpton Hotel Monaco in Denver, where I stayed and got a discount, a pop culture headline, show me the monk's key instead of show me the money from Jerry Maguire, uh, a pun on Shakespeare, this is the winner of our disc. Instead of this is the winner of our discontent. This is the winner of our discount scent. Uh, an advertising type headline. Uh, for years, Coca Cola had the slogan "The pause that refreshes," but it was P A U S E. And this is this was the pause that refreshes. They were pet friendly hotels where you could stay with your dog or cat. 
and a very blunt headline, Where to Get Drunk in Disneyland, Club 33. So some of the scuba articles I wrote for blogs, for and I wrote for Vagabond, this one said, the bride wore a white wetsuit, Caribbean weddings, Cozumel. Another one said, water beds, the Bahamas, Poseidon undersea resorts. And this was one of the first, well, two of the first uh, resorts underwater where you could stay for several days in a, in a uh, hotel underwater, basically. <laughs> this is a great name for a product. It was called the Dive Bar. It was a candy bar or a, an energy bar said so avert seasickness, eat chocolate. So these were fun to write. And then uh, I wrote something about a trip to, uh, this was Canyonlands by day and night was a, was a blog I wrote and they retweeted it and they used a line I said, it was so spectacular that we ran out of adjectives and they retweeted that on their website. Where uh, Canyonlands did that. So I thought that was a nice tribute. So uh, also under being opportunistic, when I when I was at Scuba Show last year, I told them I could help promote the show. So I wrote this article for them and they gave me these photos. And this was again, sent out to 10,000 publicists in advance. And I wrote about a friend of mine, Jim Helen, who's gonna to present to my web club, uh, uh, dive club next month. I wrote an article about him and showed, <clears throat> showed some of his images. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I wrote a story about Disco Shark, which is this giant mirrored uh, shark. It looks like a disco ball, but in the shape of a shark. And they shine these lights on it. And, and uh, people go crazy about this stuff. They, they, they show it at Coachella and things, and, and the, the fans go nuts. Uh, and, so, and this was the topic I spoke about, the very topic I'm presenting tonight, but I've expanded it with, with more recent examples. So I, I first presented this at Scuba Show, and this was on their website. And then um, being opportunistic, you know, I, I wrote for Dive Pacific years ago, but recently they got a new editor who I was introduced to, and now I have a pipeline to him and he trusts me. So I can publish on his site anytime I want. And I don't push the button, I, I load it into their system and then he gets an email and he'll review it and make any edits and then he makes it go live. But this this just happened last week. And this, if you've never heard of a Velo Dive Systems, read this article at Dive Pacific because uh, it's, it's quite interesting. It's a new system that's a third of the weight of a traditional tank in BC. And, excuse me, it helps you attain neutral buoyancy without having to wear any lead weights. It's pretty amazing. I think it's going to revolutionize the industry. And it was a big hit at uh, DEMA a few months ago. So step eight is using SEO keywords that I talked about. So uh, these words, scuba articles, copywriting, and scuba storyteller are both number one on Google that point to this page on my website. And I'll, I'll show this link to you later at the end of the presentation if you want to go there. This one page has summaries and links to virtually every story I'm showing you tonight. And another page, as I said, was Travel Copywriter. It's on the first page of Google. It's a lot of competition for that word. And then Travel and Scuba Copywriter is number five on Google. Uh, and that goes to my homepage where I have this photo. And my Porsche ad, of course. So number nine, step nine is be networking. Now, this is an interesting story. Um, I, as a freelancer, I learned how to network and it was a great help to me in my career. But I was in a networking group called BNI, Business Network International, uh, for 10 uh, for 14 years until a few years ago in San Francisco. So one day, this guy shows up at our meeting, and he works for an ad agency in Oakland, an, an advertising and PR firm in Oakland, public relations firm. So I meet him, we have coffee, and I said, tell me about your firm. And he tells me that they have a client in Micronesia, in the island of Kosrai. And a lot of people haven't heard of Kosrai, they've heard of Guam, they've heard of Palau, Yat, Chuk, or Truk Lagoon. Uh, but Kosrai is a very small island that has, I think it has 50 hotel rooms and three or four hotels total. But uh, he told me 
we send two writers a year to Cosdrive for free to promote diving. And my ears perked up. I said, what's the catch? He said, the catch is you have to have a magazine pre-approve your story. So we'll send you there. We'll pay for your hotel room, food, and um, diving. And Continental Airlines will pay for your airfare because we have a deal with them to send two riders a year and they, they pick up the airfare. So uh, I, I said, okay. And I contacted Dive Pacific where I'd been publishing articles. He goes, yeah, sure, mate, we'll publish that. This is closer to ours than you anyway. So, you know, because if you look at the map, Kosrai is not that far from New Zealand, Australia. It's 500 miles below the equator. So it's in that part of the world, but you know, Micronesia is a huge, huge area. So anyway, I got back and I, I was writing that article for them. But in the Chronicle, I saw something in the, in the Sunday Chronicle called Just Back From, and it said, oh, right here, it said, got a great photo of yourself on a race vacation, submit it, and details of your trip. So I, I had this picture that Dive Master took of me in front of the endemic green coral in the 85 degree weather, water, and the weather was also 85. And I wrote this up and I sent it to them and they published it the next week. So as I said, no fee, but it was a priceless promotion. And the client was very pleased. And then I, I dove two different days with two different dive groups. And one of them took this picture and she gave me permission. So I, I meant to write, look at that kisser, but I made a typo and they, the LA Times printed it anyway. Um, so we promoted the LA Times. And then I promoted this in Dive Pacific Magazine. This was a three page story. And I called it Untapped Pacific Gem. And then uh, this was the other two pages. And some of these are my photos and some of these are theirs. Most of these are mine actually. And, uh, and then I published this in another publication out of Dive Pacific called Asian Diver, New Zealand. And I also published it in the Traveling Divers chapbook through Undercurrent. So I published it in about six different places for them. They were very happy. And then another way to think outside the box was I had written a blog about uh, climbing Half Dome about 20 years ago, and I called it Long Day's Journey into Height on Vagabond. But diving to me was very similar to, to hiking in altitude because here I'm, I'm sucking on my uh, water, water from the camelback. But hiking and diving, all you hear is your breathing, especially if you're hiking in altitude. So so I called this article Heavy Breathing on Half Dome and Other Ways to Stay, stay in Shape for Diving. And I thought that was a very creative way to get published in a scuba magazine. So I thought outside the box and I got published. And for the majority of these articles, I was paid by the, you know, until, until COVID, any magazine I published in would pay me for the story, depending on how long it was, and for the photos. Since COVID, they've changed their tune and some pay a little bit, some websites pay, some websites don't pay, but I'm not a travel writer for the money. I'm, I'm a travel writer because I want to share my experiences. So the summit of Half Dome is 8,800 feet. And it was really quite an experience. And one I, I'll cherish with these friends of mine, I did it with six of us. Uh, another way to be thinking outside the box is I have a friend who's a hypnotherapist and uh, I, I've had sleep issues over the years because I have a very active mind. So whenever I have a session with her, she records it and then she sends me the MP3 and I've told her I'm a diver. She knows this. So the MP3 that helps me sleep takes me through the process of jumping off in my mind, in my mind's eye, leaping off the boat, doing a giant stride off the boat and descending. And as I descend in the water in my, in my, uh, as I'm trying to sleep, I descended to sleep. So it's very help. It's a very helpful technique to help me sleep, and it works very, very well all the time. So I wrote this a year ago for her uh, on her Facebook page, and I said I just got back, blah blah blah, and, and and I recapped what I all my diving and how her technique helps me sleep. So this was thinking outside the box to write about scuba for a hypnotherapist. And step 11 is being generous. Um, I've given money in the past to various charities. And one of these was an Israeli charity through my uncle, 
And um, I got their newsletter and there was a small blurb that one of their scientists in the Red Sea was creating terracotta, terracotta, terracotta tiles uh, and 3D printing them to create artificial reefs in the Red Sea. So I interviewed him, fascinating man, and I got him to speak at my dive club and I wrote this article and Scuba Diver Life had reached out to me and they said, we want you to start writing for us and they don't pay anything, but I get my name published in a global website. So I wrote this article for them because I was generous. I found out and the editor found me through SEO. And so because I was generous and I got this article printed, then I started sending them articles. Oh, then I did a social media promotion about this, about my interview with him. And I, I linked back to that article in Scuba Diver Life. And then I wrote an article called the five, top five alternative diving bucket list destinations, their photo. And uh, I took this photo, Bloody Bay Marine Park, Little Cayman's biggest attraction. I was on this trip with Sue Esty a couple of years ago, four years ago. And this is called the best scuba diving in Cosri. And this was this was was my memories of that trip through Dive Pacific. And then uh, this also this also was a photo from uh, Little Cayman. Five underwater photo tips for beginners. And this one a little hard to read. The, the best places to get married underwater. People do that. And then uh, number 12 out of 13 is be lucky. I uh, I used to live in Tiburon and every morning I would hike along the old St. Hillary Trail. And so I would see this woman there every day and I started talking to her and her name was Nikki Wood. And she and her husband, Jim, started Marin Magazine. They're well-known people in Marin. And at the time I was writing a column for the Marin Independent Journal. I was what they called a community correspondent and every week for six months, I wrote a 400 word column about something interesting in Marin, uh, interesting person, events, things like that. And uh, over by Blackie's pasture, I had seen this railroad crossing trestle. And I, I, and Nikki told me her husband was the man behind it. So I wrote this article in the IJ about him. But it was, I was lucky because I knew her. And then ironically, uh, Nikki told me that they started this website called Local Getaways that she and her daughter started and it was about California and Hawaii and I said oh I'm also a travel writer she goes oh send me some clips and so that led to me writing 10 articles for them about the best places to scuba dive in Northern California uh, mid California Southern California four islands in Hawaii and so on and I was paid for each of these and then I uh, wrote about Hawaii as well. And uh, and then this, and then the, the 13th area, 13th step is be funny. And this is, this was this dive, Jim, Jim Caller was my dive buddy. And this was in 1988. And this was, this was a story I tried to get published in uh, California Diving News, but I did get it published just about two months ago in Dive Pacific. And I called it warm memories of hypothermia, three tanks, one boat, one day, 11 Celsius, which was 50 degrees. These were the last dives I ever took in cold Cali Northern California waters. And I said, Mark Twain once said, the coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. The same might be said about a three tank, one boat, one day boat dive in Monterey, about 90 miles south of my hometown. Uh, and then be funny, Sue, Sue had just left this group the day before, uh, but this was called scuba diving with the oldies. who was, was in Little Cayman. And uh, our average age was 70. So this was a story about things that happened on this dive. They weren't senior moments, but they were just things that happened that were funny because we were all older, but experienced divers. And uh, you've seen this before, my dive buddy wears diapers. I think that's a very funny headline. And uh, what a look proposal. And this one, uh, the day I wrote a manta ray, an ecologically incorrect thing I'll never do again. These photos were taken of me by my dive buddy who, who was on the same trip. I didn't have my camera with me that day, but I, but this manta ray off of uh, one of the islands near La Paz gave all of us a ride. It was just incredible. 
And then I, I just, I'll publish this soon on, uh, on Dive Pacific. I may make it more about general drift diving, but instead of Paul Simon's slip sliding away, this was drift, drift diving away. I took this photo. And, um, and then here's a story I wrote years ago, about eight years ago, about scuba diving off the west side of Oahu. I called it West Side Story. And then uh, finally, uh, I told you about Blue Friday earlier, but Blue Friday, they tried to do it the day after Thanksgiving. No one could dive in Monterey because this is what the, the ocean looked like that day in Carmel. And uh, so when I recapped it, I, I said, uh, uh, Point Lobos, Blue Friday turned into no-go Friday to quote George Costanza when he was pretending to be a marine biologist on Seinfeld. The sea was angry that day, my friends, like an old man trying to send back soup in a deli. Remember that? Very funny. Um, and then I just wrote this the other day, Happy Blue Year instead of Happy New Year, nine resolutions to help the oceans throughout 2024. And this was picked up by various publications or uh, websites around the world. So the recap are, uh, of my 13 steps are be thick skinned, be bold, be promotional, be aware of what editors like, be writing about what you know, be persistent, be opportunistic, be using SEO keywords, be networking, be thinking outside the box, be generous, be lucky, be funny, and 14, be fearless. You never know what can happen when you put yourself out there. And this is a summary of my scuba storyteller, scuba storyteller success. For Vagablon, about 30 of the 1,500 or so blogs I wrote were about scuba. I've been published in scuba magazines and websites about 45 times, Alert Diver, Scuba Times, Adventure Journal, Dive Travel, California Diving News, Sport Diver, Dive Pacific, Asian Diver, Scuba Diver Life, Local Getaway, Scuba Show, Sun Divers Roatan, and Scuba Radio. I've written 83 newsletters for Marin Scuba Club, one a month for about seven and a half years, plus blogs and their website for Red Sail Sports. I wrote 32 newsletters, blogs, and websites. I've been published in the Chronicle, Time, LA Times, and Marin IJ. A couple of, I've written, well, there were stories about me in NCUPS, plus dozens of newsletters I don't have anymore. International Travel Writers Alliance, Undercurrent, and only seven were self-published on my website. So that's well over 200. Um, so if you have time, well, let me go to the questions and then we can get to the headlines, okay? I'll stop sharing. Hi, this is David. I finally got my sound. It just popped up and I turned it on. I don't know what happened, yeah. but... Um, how do you bill for your articles? Do you um, contract a price up front or do you just send it in and hope they pay you? Yeah, uh, well, it's not negotiable. They they have rates, they have their rates. And so with um, with, with many magazines over the years, they, they've paid, it's a bad, it was about $100 a page. I mean, what I, I just wrote for, uh, for uh, California Diving News, I think they paid me two fifty, um, because it was three pages and I sent them photos. But uh, and then blogs typically a hundred dollars or as I said, some are free, but I get published there. So you can't negotiate the rates. They tell you what the rate is on some websites. They tell you what the rates are. On others, you have to ask the uh, ask the editor when you uh, contact them when you send your query email. Well, when you send them the article, are they obligated to pay for it? Or, is, or if they don't publish it, then no, you're no, out? not obligated. I, I would never send an article uh, without first contacting them and pitching them. You know, you could send an article, you could send them a, a uh, an inquiry email and say, I have an article, or I have a photo about this. The headline is this, or the caption is this. I would write about this. And so you give them the top line information about it. And then from there, they decide if they want to publish it or not. Well, do they ever um, tell you they don't want to publish it after you send the article in? No. If they're nice, they do. I, I contacted this one magazine last year that I saw at my uh, doctor's office. It, it's kind of a California sports magazine. And 
I sent them three or four emails. No one ever responded. I called them and I got an editor on the line. She goes, oh, we got too many emails to answer. I said, that's not fair to the writers. You have to, you should just have a, an auto responder that says, you know, we got hundreds of emails. We'll get back to you if we like your story. But, you know, I mean, it's only common sense, common decency. Um, does that answer your question, David? Yeah, thank you. Okay, all right. So in the chat, Virginia said, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, no, Leeds is correct, L-E-D-E. I've never heard that before. Is that the, so lead is always what I think of when- No, no, lead is a journalism term. Okay, so is it similar to leads, like in the regular world, getting the lead on no, something? No, I mean, it, it sounds the same, but it's, it's a homonym. It, it's spelled L-E-D-E. And you're right, I should have asked 5,000 for that if he had a private jet, but- Yeah, definitely. That guy, he's, he's flying. He's he, had a, he had a garage of Porsches that were probably worth three or four hundred thousand dollars at least. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I can be your marketing person in the future. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And and Virginia, I want to I want to collaborate with you on a expedition. Absolutely. Chronicle, chronicle it in real time. I've been to tell you that. When you're submitting articles to um, various sources or whatever. Uh, or outlets, do they ever restrict that they're the only ones that can publish it? Or if you have an article, can you easily like sell it out to multiple outlets? That's a good question. Uh, unless they tell me it's exclusive, uh, like for Black Friday, Blue Friday, I sent it to California Diary News. I sent it to, I, I repurposed it for Die Pacific because there aren't too many Americans living down under, but I repurposed it and, and changed that. I said, if you're a Yank living down under, this may be of interest to you. So I never send the same article. I've rarely sent the same article to more than one publication, but in that one case I did. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I, a recent company used one of my photos without permission. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The travel okay. agent. Yeah, we talked about. I that. don't mention the name, but um, okay, yeah, 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 that, that that's was the concern yeah. because the image wasn't even connected to the real place they were attaching it to. So it's right. false advertising on their part. And I found that to be offensive. But what recourse do you have if someone rips your stuff off somehow, if they take your your writing yeah. or your photograph, is there any legal- Well, way to do you have a copyright on all your photos? You no. A, a, um, They're on a website. Do you have a watermark on them for a but, copyright? I, my website is, but they ripped it off, I think, from my website. I don't, yeah. I mean, well, it, wasn't, it wasn't publishable maybe in a magazine, but it is usable on Facebook or any right. of the social yeah. media. Yeah, you know, I know they shouldn't have done that. Uh, what, what are other people's experience with people ripping off your photos? This is David. I had a class in that when I was studying to be a professional photographer. And if you send in to the copyright office, it's copyrighted because just your uh, copyright on the photo doesn't give you a hundred percent of your rights. Okay. But if you want to contact me afterwards, um, I, uh, call there, someone has my phone number or, or just it's, it's on your, them. it's on your zoom name. Oh yeah. 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 I was just curious because I'm not a, you know, I don't make a living off of my photography, so it doesn't matter to me, but it would matter to someone who's professionally a photographer right. that they're taking their work and not getting compensated for it. And I, I'm very sensitive to artists who make a living off their work and I want to support them by not letting us give away right. or use yeah. our work so that they don't get their stuff sold who are making a living. You know what I mean? Several yeah. years back, there was a uh, a business that shall not be named, but uh, <laughs> photography and under and scuba and all that kind of like in that realm of things. And so one of my friends noticed like a bunch of like our photos like on their website that were being used that we never like gave them permission to. Um, and there's probably I don't know at least a half dozen of us that all found photos on their website and. Originally, they were um, not hearing anything from us about it. It's just like, well, 
you uh, posted it on Instagram and we, I don't know if they were like tagged in it or something. So they just felt like they could use it. Um, eventually they gave us each like a gift certificate or something like that to say they were sorry, but. Yeah, but that's not cool. That's not cool. No. No. At least give, at least give the photographer um, acknowledgement of it was their work. I mean, that would be at least something, you know? Yeah, I don't think any of it was credited as well. I don't think they had her names on it either, so. Yeah, not fair, not fair. Over Seriously. 10 years ago, the liquidated damages value of um, the copyright was $1,500 per image, but <clears throat> you'd have to look into the details. But, so there's a, yeah. um, a book by um, Edward Greenberg and Jack Resnicki called The Photographer's Survival Manual. And the yeah. subtitle is A Legal Guide for Artists in the Digital Age. It talks all about copyright and what rights you have and what you have to do. And yes, that, you know, sending things to the copyright office is different than just saying they're copyrighted. Um, and it tells you, you know, kind of what you can do. Um, and, you know, you can do things, but everything takes effort. And so, um, you know, some of it is just people don't know, and some of it is people who know but figure ah they'll get away with it. Um, so, it's a it's a reasonable book. Might want to check it, it out. It's called the Photographer Survivor Survival Manual. Survival Manual. Thank you. I am guessing you can get it on Amazon. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, uh, I think I found the one Paul was talking about, so I'm going to throw it in the chat. And yeah, it's on Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your feedback, Virginia, on uh, both verbally and in the chat. Any other questions from anyone? I had a question. Um, you said you published an undercurrent. Is that still an active publication? Uh, it's a monthly publication that our dive club gets a subscription to it. I mean, we were all we all subscribed to it earlier, but because Ken Smith, the, the uh, publisher of, of Undercurrent, is a member of our club, he gave us a special deal. But yeah, it's a monthly. It goes out at least once a month, sometimes twice a month. And then the Traveling Divers Chapbook is an annual that anyone who has a subscription undercurrent can can uh, write a review of anywhere they've dived. And um, it'll be published annually online and, and in the, the actual booklet. Has online, um, <clears throat> you know, things like scuba board, has that hurt their business, do you know? Or in terms of like number of subscribers and so forth? I don't know. I don't okay. know. No, I don't think it has. Um, I want to respond to that. Yeah, I just published an article through Undercurrent on a recent dive trip that I was on about an incident of um, oh, yeah. emergency yeah. evacuation and yeah. how well the boat did. Um, yeah. Ken is always very, very anxious to have anyone, and I'm putting the plug in for him because he's a good guy and has done a lot of really good press to expose yeah. a lot of good boats and the bad boats out there and and more of the um, not, you know, it's not edited. It's directly from the uh, people who've been on those trips to yeah. give the experience firsthand. All he'll do is edit it to cut it down to make it shorter or whatever. But he wants that information to get out to all of us so that we know recent experiences in the, the boats we go on, you know, their safety protocol, uh, you know, just. I learned something new on it recently about somebody that I dived with in the past that was highly ethical person that has ripped people off tremendously for thousands and thousands of dollars in the last year. And okay. I would have gone with him on another trip had I not read this article. And went, this can't be the same person. And then Ken sent me three more um, articles um, showing undercurrent exposing some of what he's been doing, stealing. Okay. Well, it's great to hear that they're still active. Yeah, very yeah, active. Undercurrent.org, Robert. Yep. Okay, thank you. Check it and, out. And the best thing about it is that he started it because it was a backlash against, uh, you know, we've all grown up on dive magazines like Dive Travel and Scuba Diver that, that have these glowing reports of these resorts with photos. Sure. They're really advertorials. They have to pay the publication to print these articles about right. them as well as buy ads. Right. So he said, I don't want any advertising. I want the divers to tell their own stories. Right. And that's, that's how it, uh, and it, it, it subsists by, by your uh, annual dues. Okay, thank you. 
Yeah, undercurrent.org. Yep, great. Other questions? Just a comment. I really love what you presented. I didn't even know you had a twin, by the way, and I've known you forever. So <laughs> we learned something. He's on the call, but he, he muted his, uh, his video. But anyway, I, I found it interesting that we don't think about um, yeah. publishing yeah. or doing a lot of this because it, it sounds like so much work, but having sort of the 12, 13 steps of things to think about makes it more yeah. doable. And so thank you for sharing sure. and inspiring us to kind of think about, you know, how we can do this. Cause I think we all have stories. We just, yeah. I, I presented 10 minutes of this last year during our, our group presentation, but this was the expanded version. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So Thanks for doing it. Thank you. So I had a question about the, uh, the SCO keywords. Yeah, sure. Bruce. So it looks, it looks like what you did is you, you kind of created some titles for yourself. And you kept using those titles over and over again. Is that is that what it, what it is? But, but you have to be aware of the keyword density. Uh, there's a there's a you know in the Google algorithm, it, which changes every six months or every year. Uh, it's usually 200, 250 words uh, in, in terms of the frequency. You can't put scuba copywriter in every paragraph. If you do that, they'll blackball your website and it'll never be listed. You have to follow the formula of doing it so many times throughout the article, but not too often. Hmm. Interesting. This is something I, I learned from writing other people's websites that I've applied to my own. And do they tell you what that is? It, it varies from time to time, Helga. Okay. Well, That's how that. do you know if you put too many or too little? <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's a good question. I can't tell you anything. I mean, to me, it is just intuition from writing so many websites. Um, but you know, I just know I shouldn't do it every paragraph. I do it every three or four. But I mean, you you could follow that formula to the letter, and you know, like one of us, I don't think we'd be in the top, you know, five pages. It. I mean, a lot of it isn't a lot of it. Like how many articles you've written that are right, like right. yeah, a lot of it is. Uh, and I was just writing a, a website for a very high-end construction uh, guy in, in Carmel, Monterey. Yeah. If you use the, the more precise and um, the, the more precise the, the term, the less often it's used. If yeah. you, you're a home builder Carmel, it's not going to be, I mean, it's going to be very popular and, and it'll be thousands of pages of that. But if you use a specific keyword like um, general contractor or lead certified general contractor Carmel, then that's more specific and fewer people will have used it. So it'll stand out more and be rated higher. Okay. The more specific it is, the, 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 the rarer it is, the more it'll stand out. Okay. You know, if, you, if you use the word writer, <laughs> how many people can use that? But if you use scuba copywriter or scuba and travel writer, that's less common. It's kind of common sense. Anyway, I don't think we have time for a workshop, but uh, let me just go back to my last page. <laughs> so, uh, can you see this again? So if you want to see an archive of virtually all the stories I showed you, it's at scubastoryteller.com. And if you have any questions, feedback, or you want to collaborate on a story, my email is my name, Gil at cyber.com. I thank you again. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Gil. That was outstanding. Excellent. Uh -huh. We missed it, the, um, the, the Long Beach show, but he's going to be back again next year, right? Or this year. Yeah. I, I just submitted some story ideas uh, this week okay. for the Long Beach show. Well, now it's going to be in LA at the LA Convention Center. Oh, okay. June, June 1 and 2. Bruce was a speaker there this year. I, I missed him. Oh. Yeah. You're going to speak again this year, Bruce? Uh, yeah, I am. Good. All right. Well, thank you all again. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was awesome. Good. Thanks, Gil. Uh, I I have a question. Um, I'm still I missed the Hawaii meeting. Has that 
been posted anywhere yet? Um, I don't know if that one's been posted yet. I don't, I don't think we've posted that one. We have a bit of a backlog that we have to uh, get up there. Uh, and there was one meeting in the past few months that we did forget to record. And I can't remember if that was it or not. Um, but Paul reminded me earlier in the night that we need to get those uploaded. So we'll work okay. on those over. Can you um, post the links in the newsletter when, when they are published or posted? Uh, just look at the YouTube channel. Yeah, we don't normally pu publish it in the newsletter, but if you just search YouTube and end cups, you'll you'll find our channel, and um, they just almost all of them are uh, posted there. We can at least probably put a link to the YouTube channel in the on the website. Yeah, that'd be a good oh, idea. Yeah, yeah, we have a link to the Vimeo channel on our website, and after each meeting, we post it after the speaker's bio. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Great. Right. Okay, I am just finishing up a couple things to get ready for the mini comps, uh, as well as Helga reminded me to say who our photographer and photo of the year are from 2023. Um, so I am getting that stuff all together momentarily. I'm going to excuse myself. Good night, everyone. Thank you again. Good night.